1 John chapter 2, as we work through the book of John, remember this is John that walked with Jesus, John, who wrote Big John, and this is Baby John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And so uh, we're going to be covering verses 3 through uh, up right around verse 9 or 10, right? 11. Now, we'll go all the way through verse 11. So let's read this morning. Now, verse 3, 1 John chapter 2. Now, by this we know that we know him, if what? If we keep his commands. Verse 4, he who says, I know Jesus, I'm saved, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, what? He's a liar, and the truth is not in him. 5, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him, and by this we know that we are in him. Six, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as Jesus, just as he walked. Seven through 11. Now, brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but it's an old commandment which you have heard from the very beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Eight, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and then the true light is already shining. Nine, he who says he's in the light and hates his brother, he's in what? He's in darkness until now. Ten, he who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Eleven, but he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Church, a couple of weeks ago, we ended with... uh, Verses 1 and 2, there in, at the beginning of the chapter, and we talked about how Jesus was our advocate. He was our, our defense, our, our, our basically our attorney who defends us because we are guilty, and, and he, he, he declares that we are guilty, but he also declares that we're innocent because we have been forgiven. And then it says he's the big word, propitiation. He's the not the down payment, but he basically becomes bail, that, that Jesus became the payment for our sin. We ended there, and now here in verses 3 through 11 this morning, James is, a, or should I, excuse me, John is a very practical book. If it, it deals with people who think they're saved but are not, and it also deals with people who are saved, but they're not living like they're saved. He gives a lot of different tests so you can begin to measure yourself up and see, am am I where I need to be? Am I saved? Or if I am saved, am I walking with Christ the way I should be? Then so I've titled the message this morning, Know That You Know, Standing Right With God. Know That You Know, Standing Right With God. Here in the very beginning of verse 3, it says, says this, Now, by this, we know that we know him. By this that he's about to say, we know that we know him if we keep his commands. So let's stop right there. If we keep his commandments, let's stop right there. Let's just focus on that truth for a little bit, the beginning of verse 3. By this, we know that we know him if we keep his commands. Is John is saying that we write the Ten Commandments and we keep them in our wallet? Is that what he's talking about? We keep his commands? I got them in a safe place. I got them in a picture in our, a lot of us have some sort of perhaps something to do with the Ten Commandments and they're maybe hanging on our wall. Is that what he's talking about? Keeping his commands? And the answer is no, that's not how what he is referring to. As we're looking at this passage, he says, this is one of the ways that you can know that you're saved. He's already given a couple of other tests, that, that, that you love to be with God's people. And I look back in my days before I got saved, I didn't love to be. I came to church because my mom was a Sunday school teacher and I really didn't have a choice, but I didn't really love to be with God's people. They, they bothered me. I would never say that, but they convicted me. Their wholesome talk, and I, I kind of wanted to party out and all that stuff. And, and they wanted to talk, you know, how to be more like God. That means you got to quit loving yourself and, and living for yourself. So I flunked that test, though I, I would have never known it back then. I said, yeah, I like being with God's people. I go to church on Sunday mornings. And so he says, this is one of the ways we can tell 
if we're saved, that we here keep his commands. Now, I think I might have a, a PowerPoint there. Which commands is he talking about? The Ten Commandments? Well, that could be that. Most people have probably never thought about this, but if you'll go and look at every place Jesus told us to do, there are 49 commands of Jesus in your New Testament. Do I, do I have a PowerPoint with... Tell me if I have them up there. I think I... Tell me if I snuck in. There are 49 commands. Is there one? Is it up there? If it is, it might be on point two, but that's okay. Go to it anyway. See if, see if I snuck that in there. No, that's not it. Is there one? You'll see it. It's the whole page. There's 49 commands of Christ. If I didn't, I don't have time. I'll just pass this around to you. There are 49 different commands that Jesus gave us. He commanded us to be saved. He commanded us to repent. He commanded us to, to be reconciled with God. He commanded us to keep a word that we shared with people. He commanded us to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. He commanded us to go and make disciples. And so which of the 49, no, that's not it. Don't worry about it. Which of the 49 is Jesus referring to here? Is John saying, we know that we're saved if we keep his commands. Can I just pick the ones I want to pick? I say, well, you know, I like seven of the Ten Commandments. I do pretty good. 70, that's a passing grade. Isn't that a C? So how do we know what he's talking about? Well, you can sum up all the 49 commands that Jesus gave us in the New Testament. You can sum up the Ten Commandments here in Matthew, I think, 22. I think we have it here. Uh, let me see, uh, go to, yeah, that's a good one, but that's not, see if, do I have Matthew, um, tell me if I have Matthew chapter 22, do I have it? Okay, if it's not up there, don't worry about it, uh, no, that's not it, you can close your eyes on the answer to that one, go in your Bibles, <laughs> go to, uh, go to Matthew, uh, and let's see if we can just find, a. Uh, Matthew 22, right? So you're in 1 John. Go over to Matthew chapter 22. And, and this verse sums up really everything that, that Jesus is saying. Uh, Matthew chapter 22. And how about verse about 36? They were trying to trap Jesus. And uh, I guess the, the one I sent you didn't have. Yeah, there you go. Okay, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced, the, they were always trying to trick him. Right? Sometimes if we're not careful, we're deceitful. We're trying to trick somebody with a question. And they're always trying to trick Jesus. And so he answered them correctly. He silenced them. So they got together and said, how can we trap this Jesus guy? This guy's sharp, man. We can't trap him. And, and so he says this. Um, okay, that's not it. I was just reading it. What happened? It disappeared. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Am I losing it over here? Okay, there it is. Yeah. Okay, but when the Pharisees heard he had silenced the Sadducees, I guess this on a, on a time frame, after 10 seconds it goes away. They gathered together, then one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question, trying to test him, saying, Hey, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. He said, This is the first and the great commandment. And then he said what? The second is pretty much the same thing. So he boils down everything in the Old Testament. He boils down the Ten Commandments to this. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he said the second one is pretty much the same thing, verse 39. And the second is like it, you shall love the, your neighbor as yourself. So go back to 1 John here. And he says this is one of the ways you can know a person is saved. Well, are they walking in the commands of, of God? Well, which ones? Well, that one alone is it obvious to other people that you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? When people see you at work or at home, is it obvious that people see a person who loves God with all that's within you? I'm not saying perfect, but do people see a person and do you not just honor God and, and love Him? Do you love people, right? And not just people that you like. Do you love people? That's a sign that Jesus is living inside of you. He says, by this you can know if you're saved. He didn't say church attendance. He didn't say being a church member. He didn't say you've said a sinner's prayer. He didn't say you'll know them because uh, uh, they've been baptized or because they have a title at their church. He didn't say any of that. He says one of the tests, one of the ways you can know if you or a person is saved is generally speaking, are they walking in fulfillment, in obedience 
to the commands of God. It's one of the simple, easy ways to figure out if a tr person is truly born again. So here's the first truth I want to share with you as we're looking at this passage here in 1 John, and it's this. A, a, a true believer, a true Christian, wants to know God's commands, and he wants to obey them. A true believer wants to know. So if you're telling me you've been saved X, X amount of years, and there's a lot of glitch in the fact that you don't even know some of the commands of Jesus, and and you really don't want to follow them on a regular basis, that ought to be a, a clue. What do they do when you're close, you're doing charades or something like that? Ding, 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 ding right here. John says you're a liar. John wouldn't be allowed in most modern churches today because he told the truth just like his master Jesus did. And he said you're lying to yourself, you're kidding yourself, you're fooling yourself. All right, so as we get started this morning, the first thing I want to say to you is this. A true believer knows his commands, and you want to keep them. You want to honor the Lord that saved you. And if you're struggling in some of the most basic areas on a regular basis, can I say to you, you got religion, but you didn't get Jesus. So let's jump into this. Let's get started this morning. So how do we obey God's commands? Let me tell you this. Most people do not obey the commands of Christ, the vast majority. I'll just give you a couple of examples. One of them is remember the Sabbath day as every other day. Remember the Sabbath day is a good way to make double time because at work they'll pay me double time if I work on a Sunday. That's what the Lord said, right? Remember the Sabbath day so you can get double time. So 85% of Hardin County is not in church. God says, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it separate. Don't do what everybody else does on, on the Sabbath day, on the day of worship. And yet, 85% of Hardin County says what? No, thank you. We don't obey a simple command like that. Um, Matthew 23, 23 says we, we ought to tithe, right? In some churches, 80% of the church doesn't tithe. Eight out of every 10 members don't tithe. We're talking church. I'm not even talking about outside of church. 80% of people here saying, I love God, obey his commands. But when it comes to money, they don't even give God his share. How many lost people you think tithe? Okay, so we talk about church attendance. We talk two simple things, tithing. And yet majority would say to you, they're saved. Fact of the matter is, you're not saved. What are you saved from? <laughs> Who saved you? We can go on and on and on, but we don't obey the commands of the Lord, and that ought to just set, set something off with you. I'm not right with God. But Satan would love to keep you in deception, saying you're okay compared to some really bad people. You're not so bad. So let's jump in. How do we obey God's commands? Well, it's obvious most people aren't, but we're not most people if we're calling ourselves believers in Christ. If I was to say, how many of you are saved? I don't know. Some of you would be embarrassed not to raise your hand. I'm thinking back when I was 22, 23, just before I got saved. If I was in church and my pastor asked that, I would have raised my hand. I didn't want to look like a pagan or a heathen. You know what I'm saying, <laughs> I want to look like I'm, I'm a nice guy. I I, I go surfing, but I, I wear a cross around my neck. You know what I'm saying? Because I always pray that the sharks won't get me. You know what I'm saying? So I pray. I'm a praying man, right? And so I would have raised my head saying, I'm a Christian, but I wasn't. I wasn't even close to being one. I prayed a prayer. I, I got baptized. I did all those things, but that doesn't make you saved. Like somebody says, going into a garage doesn't make you a car, and going to McDonald's doesn't make you a Big Mac. That just means you're out of place. <laughs> but that doesn't mean something's happened on the inside. So look at Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah, this is the Lord. Speaking of Jeremiah to write down, he says this, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. You ever want to know how God thinks about you? Well, here's one of the things God says. I know the thoughts that I think about you, says the Lord. My thoughts towards you are of what? I, I want to give you peace. I don't want to do evil. Most people think God's out to bop them and get them. He's trying to rescue you. My thoughts are, are peace, not of evil. I want to give you future, and I want to give you, I want to give you hope. 
want to give you something. Would you go to a, I've done a lot of, I've done a funeral a month. This, these first uh, nine months of September, we've had a lot of people pass away. People have friends. I'm, I'm averaging a funeral a month. And I can tell the difference between a Christian funeral and a lost funeral. It's so sad when I do a funeral when the person is not saved and nobody is like, how sad. Seeing people actually come with alcohol in their breath during the funeral. They're just, I guess, what do you have? If you don't have Jesus, what do you got look to look forward to? I mean, what, you know, I'm trying to think how it was before I got saved. If I was 60 now, four, and not saved, what would I do at a funeral? And it's just so sad. Uh, uh, people will put like a, sometimes a Jack Daniels bottle inside the casket and, you know, trying to be cool, I'm thinking. But when you don't know Jesus, you know, when you don't know the Lord, it's like, how do you, how do you cope with, with impending doom, so to speak, or, or, or grieving? So it says, I've come to give you, I want to give you hope that this life isn't, this isn't it. It's the next life that's going to be the one where we're going to celebrate right now. I want to give you a future. I want to give you hope. Then he says, then you will call upon me. If you'll understand this, you will call upon me and go and pray to me. And God says, then what? Then I will listen to you, 13, and you will seek me and find me when you got nothing else better to do on a Sunday morning. Is that what he says? You will come and seek me. and You'll find me when? When you search for me with all your heart. I tell you about that time many, many years ago. Uh, we have a, a couple in our church. They were a Christian couple, and they had a daughter. <clears throat> and there was a teenage kid in our church that liked her. And so he wanted to date her. And the parents said, sweetheart, you can't date that boy. He's not a Christian boy. And so she had to tell the kid that, you know, according to the Bible, I'm not supposed to be unequally yoked, and it won't work out. You're, I know you want to date me, but my parents said you can't because you're not a Christian. So the next Sunday, you know, the girl tells the boy that. The next Sunday during the invitation... That teenage boy was over here saying, oh, Jesus, come into my life. <laughs> Looking for the girl. Oh, Jesus, come into my <laughs> See, I've given my life to Jesus. <laughs> That's not searching for the Lord with all your heart. I used to do a lot of prison ministry when I was in Texas, and a lot of people in prison want to pray, ask Jesus into their life. Man, it was easy. When I did street ministry, it was easy to get the homeless people to pray a prayer. Because when you're in a jail, Jesus is good news. He might get you what? A lighter sentence. Remember one guy, man, he was riding me all the time. And the moment that they let him out early, guess what? Boom, that was it. A lot of times we're not really searching for Jesus with all our heart. We want a hand out, but we don't want a hand up to the Lord. And Jeremiah says this. Then you will search me, and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. As we're talking about following the commands of the Lord, God has given us something that's harder to attain than anything else, and God's given you and I a will. Angels don't have wills. Angels pretty much do everything God says to do. One time in history, God gave the angels a time, uh, time to rebel, and a third of them were so captivated by how cunning Satan was. Let me tell you how clever Satan is, according to the book of Revelation. One third of the angels looked into the face of Satan, and he convinced them to walk away from following God the Father? You think you're more clever than the evil one? He could whip you upside the head so quick if you're not walking in the word and walking in the spirit. One third looked at him and chose to follow him rather than God the Father. Oh, he's beautiful and clever. Very enticing. Not a red pitchfork, but comes as a great looking lady or a guy with a lot of money. We've been given a will. And that will is stronger and tougher than iron or steel. And that will is hard to bend or break. Only the Lord can do that in our lives. We don't want to give God our will. We, we've got time on Sunday mornings, this 80, 90 something thousand people saying, I'm not giving it to God. I don't want, I, I'm, I don't want to give him my energy. I don't want to give him my finances. This is my will and my time, my money, my possessions, my talents. They belong to me and I'm not going to use them for God. 
No, very clearly our will is very strong and only the Lord can get that will and, and begin to break it. You ever, those of us that had a baby when their baby was whatever, a year or year and a half, and you gave them a passy, right? And you ever you knew it was time to eat, you had some little Gerber or, or milk or something good to give them, you ever tried to take that little passy, that rattler out of their hand? What would they have to do? <laughs> You're trying to take it out of their hand because you got something better to give them, but they don't want to do it. You know what? Those babies are now 30, 40, 50, and 60 years old, and we're doing that to God. He's trying to take something out of our hands, and we're, yeah. And we don't want to let go of our will because somehow in our arrogance, we think we're smarter than God. And he says right here, if you'll turn your heart towards me, when you seek me with all of your heart, God says, then, then I will do these things. A lot of times, you know why we struggle with obeying the commands of God? We're still holding on to our will. We still think, I want, most people, the neighborhood they choose to move into, they never ask God. Most people, the house, most people, the job they picked had to do with money rather than, God, where do you want me to work? Where would I best represent you? Can you imagine if I was going to go to the mission field and I had a choice between going to Africa or going to Japan or joining the South America and I asked, which one pays more per year? You say, Herb, how worldly. You're thinking of going to the mission field and you're asking which job pays you more, the one in Japan, Africa, or South America? And I would say, then what's the difference between me and you? Why are you making decisions, very important decisions, and you're never asking God where he wants you? He might want you in a worse neighborhood. He might want you in a job that doesn't pay as much. Do you understand how the world has crept into our thinking, and very few of us think like the Lord? We always think, how does this best benefit me, rather than how does this best benefit God? One of the most popular songs, you old geezers like me will remember, <clears throat> it was a song, it's probably one of the most demonic songs. You might laugh at me. You're thinking, oh, he's going to say ACDC, highway to hell, or whatever, right? You think, oh, that's what he's going to quote. No, actually, it's a song by Frank Sinatra, one of the most demonic songs ever written. It's one of the most popular ever, probably on YouTube, and it's called, I Did It. That's what we still are doing. I'm doing God's will my way. <laughs> no, 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 no. Jesus is the way, the truth. The reason we're having such a hard time following God's commands, here's the first thing I want to say to you, is we've never surrendered our will over to God's. The Bible says in Corinthians, you've been bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself. Start telling yourself, you don't own me anymore. <laughs> you, Herb, you don't own me anymore. <clears throat> I've been bought with a price. <clears throat> I belong to the Lord. He tells me what to do. See, you either serve Lord Jesus or you serve Lord feelings. Most of us serve Lord feelings. Whatever our feelings tell us is that's what we do. I remember there was a, a seminary professor <clears throat> and he was telling his class about a nursing home he went to every week. And a guy came up to him afterwards and said, man, I really admire you. You got this call from God to go to this nursing home every week. I don't think I can do that. And the professor said, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. What, what do you mean this call from God? He says, you think I like going to a nursing home where sometimes they stink and smell like urine? Half the time, they don't even know I'm there. Half the time, mentally, they're, they're not listening, understanding anything I am saying. You think I like going to that place? I go because God has called us to go and take care of widows and orphans and people that are less privileged. I'm not going because I like to go. I'm going because we're called to go. I thought, what a great answer. First truth I want to share with you then is how do we obey God's command? My question to you is, have you, re are you really surrendered your will? I'm not asking you if you pray to prayer, but does your will really belong to God? Have you surrendered? Is he really your Lord? You understand the difference between Lord and Savior? 
There's a lot of people that they want to pray and ask Jesus to be their Savior, but they still want to be the Lord of their life. My friend, this is a package deal. If he's your Savior, then he is your Lord, but he cannot be one or the other. I can't say I want him to save me, but I'm going to be my own Lord. Then you are still, my friend, lost in your sin. The first truth I want to share with you is this. Have you or you must surrender your will to God, and it'll make following God's commands a lot easier because this is a way you can tell if you're saved. Listen, do you think your lost neighbor's saved? Man, I know my neighbor's saved. He goes to church on Sunday morning. Well, I know he's saved. He's a member of so-and-so church. None of your <laughs> friends that you work with are impressed that you got baptized. Well, I know my friend is saved. He got baptized. That's not how they know that you're saved. And it's not that you told them that you're saved. That's not how they know that you're saved. They're going to watch the way you live to determine whether you're saved or not. Here's the second truth I want to share with you. Look at Psalm 119, 66. David said this, I made haste and I did not delay to keep <clears throat> your commandments. You ever have any kids, parents? <clears throat> and you said... Come on up. I, I want you to eat your broccoli and your cauliflower. How many even run upstairs for that? Come on, tell the truth and shame the devil. How, how, how fast do they run? Tell them I got double stuff, chocolate chip, Oreos, ice cream to go with it with a little lemon pie. And, man, I'm telling you. You don't have to say it twice. Can I get a witness right here? <laughs> well, you go running to do what you want to do, but when it comes to God's will, let me tell you this. If you're claiming to be a believer, this is how people know that you're a believer. You keep God's commands. David said, I made haste. I did not delay <clears throat> to keep your commandments. Proverbs 3, 5 says this. Trust in the Lord with some of your heart. <clears throat> Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean upon what? Don't think. You have to figure this out. Don't try to be clever and on your own determine whether this is God's will. Listen, when it comes to God's commands, <clears throat> most of us sit here and say, how will this benefit me? What God is asking me to do, how will this make me look? How will, this, will I come out ahead? Most of the time, can you find any place in the Bible where God says, take your time in what I'm asking you to do? Think about it for a couple of months. Is there any place where anybody is told, and God says, you want to take a couple of years? Yeah, I'm okay with that. This guy by the name of Jonah, he did that, right? God says, go, go speak to the Ninevites. I know you hate them. They've been mean to, to your people. I know that, 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 that you can't stand them, but you're going to want to love to run over and witness to them. And did Jonah say, I'm on my way? Did anybody ever come out ahead because they dragged their feet when God gave them a command. Anybody say, man, I'm sure glad I, I, I just drugged my feet for a couple of months in, in responding to God. Did anybody in the Bible, you can say, man, they, they really came out ahead. Then what makes you think you and I are going to come out ahead and saying, God, your will better fit my agenda because if it doesn't, I'm not going to follow it. And this is what we often do. We sit here and we think about it. And we say, how will this come across? Some of you heard my testimony years ago where I hate cold weather. <clears throat> I grew up in the deep south. And anything below 60 was cold for me, right? I'm cold. And man, when I first started thinking, okay, I'm leaving the street ministry. I think I'm either going to become a missionary or go to college campuses and, and try to witness to the high college kids, people about my age, a few years younger than me, or perhaps be a minister Every offer I got was from a cold state. Everyone. None. None were Myrtle Beach or, you know, Cocoa Beach, Florida or L.A. You know what I'm saying? Close to the ocean. I still have them. Listen, I'm the only probably pastor in Kentucky with three surfboards in my basement. Three. In case there's a flood, I'm ready to go. You know what I'm saying? I'm ready to. I'm, <laughs> hey, half, half surfboard will travel. And so every offer I got was in a cold place. And, and I'm, I'm ashamed and I'm embarrassed, but I, I did not want to go to those places. And one of them got real serious and said, hey, send us a tape of you preaching. So I picked the hardest sermon I'd ever preached. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Hard. 
just a, yeah. and I thought, well, that'll, that'll shut him up. They'll say, I don't want that guy. Man, he's just hard. He don't even understand grace. So I sent him the hardest sermon I'd ever preached. And guess what they did a week later? They said, we're interested. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. One of them, you know, I could tell he was asking questions. And I could tell he was not open to tongues. I, and so when he got to spiritual gifts, I said, I speak in tongues. So I, I was hoping he would hang. Oh, that's okay. He said, let's keep going with the interview. I thought, oh, on it. No matter what I was doing, everything was from Alaska and Minnesota and, and uh, up in the uh, northern part of New York. And over and over, I kept making excuses. See, I didn't want to surrender my will to God if it meant cold weather. <laughs> And I, I could hear God saying, I'll wait as long as you, you want to wait five years. I'll let you stay right there doing street ministry in Fort Worth. You're not called to do it anymore, but you don't want to listen to me. I'll just keep waiting. I can wait longer than you, Herb. So, so what am I saying as we're looking at Psalm 119 and Psalm 3, verses 5 through 7? I, I'm simply saying this. God has called us to be quick to obey. Don't drag your feet. The reason sometimes we have a difficulty in is we use our mind and ask, how does this benefit me? Can I say to you, you're not in the equation. This is not about you anymore. It's about the Lord. And he's trying to put you where he wants you to be. He's not asking you for your permission. He's not saying, please, Herb, we need you. Please agree with me. See, a wise man learns, learns to obey God quickly. God said, do this. He is smarter than me. Lord, bend my will to where I need to be. It's okay to be honest and say, Lord, I'm not crazy about cold weather. My extremities freeze up. My fingers and my toes get really cold and numb when it gets cold. I can't handle cold weather very well. But God's not saying, oh, Herb, I'm so sorry. I inconvenienced you. Oh, son, what was I doing? I should have sent you warm climate. I forgot about you don't like cold weather. Would you please forgive me? <laughs> and yet that's what we do. We think God's will has to fit what we like to do. You're no longer part of the equation. You sold your soul to the Lord. You surrendered. You let him buy you through the blood of Jesus Christ. He is smarter than you. Just keep telling yourself. Two things I've learned in life. One, there's a God. Two, I'm not him. It's okay to say that. You're not God. That means he's smarter than you. He sees down the road better than you. He knows where you need to be. You can be like Jonah and run, but you'll be miserable not walking fully in God's will. So one of the ways we learn is be quick to obey. When God says it, then simply do it. Have you ever thought about Jesus? Uh, you, ever, you ever talk to a person that was a know-it-all? Did any of you think of yourself when I said that? <laughs> Do you know there's some people that think you're a know-it-all? I know you thought of somebody else, right? There you go. There's one honest man going to heaven right there. That man is saved and born again, right? But you probably thought of somebody else. Not one of you thought of yourself. And, and all the people said, that's what I thought, right? Well, there's somebody thought you <laughs> when I said that. Where am I going? I don't know. That was just a good illustration. No, I'm going somewhere with that. I was going somewhere with that. Okay, yes, here we go. There was one know-it-all. His name was Jesus. Jesus was a know-it-all. I mean, he knew it all. He was God. And did Mary and Joseph know it all? Mary and Joseph were humans like you and I, right? Almost perfect parents, but not perfect, right? None of the teenagers laughed on that one, so I'll keep going. So Mary and Joseph made mistakes. They probably had a bad day. Maybe they accused Jesus of doing something that their older brother or sister did. I mean, think about it. I mean, that was a regular home. They didn't say, oh, Jesus has a halo about him. No, Jesus was a teenager. He did teenage stuff, right? He didn't never sinned. But what I'm saying is mommy and daddy made some mistakes over Jesus. And did Jesus ever say, I want to let you know I'm God? And I know way better than you, mom and dad, and you better listen to me. Did Jesus ever do that? He didn't. Did they ever perhaps tell him to do something that maybe wasn't the best? And the answer is probably once in his entire life. Was he ever smart, Alec? Was, did he ever mock them? Did he ever say, I know more than you, I'm not going to do it? He never did that. And you have Jesus' spirit in you if you're born again. That ability 
for Jesus didn't take his time a few weeks or months when he was asked by a mom and dad to do something. Remember that time? There was that jar and it was running out and Jesus turned it in, remember? Filled it up. He didn't say, woman, what are you talking about? Jesus obeyed mom and dad perfectly every time without delayed obedience. The reason we have a hard time sometimes walking in God's command is number two, we haven't learned to be quick to obey. We're leaning on our own understanding. Here's number three. <clears throat> the third thing that I want to say to you <clears throat> is uh, look at uh, Philippians 3.14. Paul says, forgetting those things that are behind me. In other words, quit harping on them and going over them over and over. Straining forward to what is ahead. I press what? On where? Towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. Do I have that one up there? Paul says, I fought the good fight. Do I have that one up there? Yeah. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. In other words, my life is being poured out as a sweet sacrifice to the Lord as they would pour a wine over a sacrifice of a, of, of a, a bull or a lamb, whatever. As to, that sweet aroma to come up to the nostrils of the Lord, symbolic. I'm being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. Uh, they're, they're almost ready to, to kill me, Paul is saying. And he says this, I have fought the what? See, a lot of times we fight, but we don't fight good fights. We fight fights of selfishness and of greed and covetousness. Paul says, I fought the good fight. I have what? I finished the race and I've kept the faith. I have finished the race. We're, we're talking about following the commands of God. And oftentimes we have a difficult time in following the commands of God, because, my friend, we start obeying God, but we never finish what He has called us to do. I love the story. I don't know the name of the company. Many, many years ago, they had, I think maybe it was like 10 regional managers in the United States, and the, the president was ready to pick a vice president. So he called this 10 top regional managers in the U.S. to this really, really nice cabin he had built somewhere out in the woods. I don't know where it was. And he invited all 10, paid for their flights and everything. He says, I want you to show up this address, this particular state and city. He says, and I'm going to name the vice president. Everybody was excited. Who's going to get to be the vice president? They had all become regional managers. They were big shots. They're all sharp, you know what I'm saying, quick on their feet. So they all show up and they go and they, they catch this, uh, uh, this van is waiting for them at the airport. And, and takes them to this log cabin, super nice kind of a log cabin. And when they get there, there's a note saying, uh, put on these overalls and I want you to go out and dig a one foot, one foot ditch deep, one foot deep ditch. Is that right? One foot <laughs> deep ditch. Is that right? One foot deep. Yeah, one foot, 12 inches, 12 inches. Uh, a ditch around, uh, you know, the log cabin. And they all read them. They thought, what? What? Our presence, he doesn't even know who we are. We're not construction guys. We're, you know, we're, we're CEO material. We don't use our hands. And they all just start flapping the gums, complaining, complaining, all of them. And they put their overalls on, but they just go on the rocking chairs on the front porch. And, and they just sit back and say, you know what? We'll just tell them we got here late. And they came up with all kinds of excuses. And one of the 10 said, hey, listen. This is what our boss asked us to do. He asked us to dig a one-foot ditch around the entire, you know, log cabin. And if you don't want to do it, I guess I will. So he gets, he gets his spade, this shovel, and he puts it in. And, he, you know, he gets a, some, he throws a, 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 his first spade full out. And when he does, out of the log cabin walks the boss who was hiding. And he says, hey, the rest of you nine, I'm not going to wait till the end of this weekend to introduce to you the next vice president. There he is with the shovel in his hand. <laughs> See, God's always testing you. You're going to finish what he's asked you to do. Or are you just going to go part of the way? That's great. I'm glad you were excited a year ago or five years ago or seven years ago. But are you finishing what God has asked you to do? Has he called you to do something? Have you gone halfway? He didn't say, I started the race. He said, I, I, have you finished the race that God has assigned you? Are you still running? 
I've noticed over the years and over the decades of some of the Lord, a lot of people, when they start kind of getting near retirement, they start coasting in their walk with the Lord. You can retire from your job, but you don't retire from the Lord. I think if the person says, you know what, I want to go to a larger church where I can just sit back and coast. After all you've been taught, you should be a teacher by now, and you're sitting back, and that's all you're doing in your church year after year after year with all you've been taught, to whom much has been given. Much is required from you, and you're sitting back, and that is all you're doing in your church. You ought to repent. You have been fed and given so much. And you're sitting back and do this little trinket thing that a baby Christian could do who doesn't have a lot of knowledge yet. And you know I'm speaking the truth. You know what I'm saying is right. God didn't ask you to retire and then retire from serving him. That's when you should begin serving him the most. You have the most time and you're further along and wiser in your walk with the Lord. See, I want to speak up for my Lord. I don't care if other people don't. He deserves more than we're giving him. And you know that's right. He deserves your very best. Not part, not three quarters. He deserves everything. All your heart. Love him with all your heart, your mind, your strength. That means everything within belongs to him. I, I want to stand up for him. He deserves better than the church is giving him in this country. And you know what I'm saying is right. I finished the race. Paul at the very end, he didn't say, I'm going to coast. I'm going to write me a book and get a $5 million advance. He says, I keep speaking, speaking the truth to the Roman legion, and I don't care what they do to me. My life belongs to the Lord. If God is saying, this is all I have time left for you, then so be it. So what am I saying? The third truth is this. The reason we have a hard time Following God's command is that we don't finish what we have started. And Paul says, I have fought the good fight, and I finished the race. I completed everything. It, you know the, where Jesus says, well done, my good. He didn't say well spoken. He didn't say well thought of. He said, well done. That means you did it on that day that you face him. He didn't say, you said it well. Oh, man, you were eloquent. Woohoo! You were articulate. No. He didn't say, well spoken. He didn't say, I thought about doing your will, God. Doesn't that count for anything? You ever told your spouse, honey, it's the thought that counts. You didn't get me nothing for my birthday, but I thought about it. Oh, okay, honey. You thought about it. Well, so, sweetheart, that was so nice of you. The thought, <laughs> the thought doesn't count. It's not well spoken, not well thought of, but well done. And on judgment day, God will say, did you do it? Did you finish what I asked you that you started? You know you're going to face God on judgment day. You do get that, right? And you won't look at me on judgment and say, my pastor didn't tell me. Because he'll have me right next to say, Lord, I told him. You remember, you put that in my heart to tell him. They didn't do it. And first I'll answer him, did I do it? Forget you guys. I got to deal with me first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go to the last point then. We don't finish. 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 Finish strong. Fight the good fight. Finish what God has put in your heart. Use everything he's given to you. Much has been given to you. Now give. Give your time. Give your energies, your talents away to God. You use them in the business world. You use them for the Lord. Let me give you one more then. Look at verses 7 through 10. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you. It's an old commandment which you've heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the very beginning. It almost sounds like he's repeating himself. Again, a new commandment I write to you. Which one is he? He's saying, listen, from the very beginning, you know you need to know. But Jesus is saying, no, don't love just people that love you. This is a new commandment. He says, love your enemies. <laughs> don't just love your friends. Everybody loved their friends. But he said, no, 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 no. I want you to love your enemies. This is the new commandment, verse 8. I write to you, this thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the light of Christ is already shining. Nine, he who says he's in the light but doesn't like his brother. Listen, my friend, if you can't like somebody who's got a different color of skin for you, you're not going to heaven. If you only love people your color of skin, you ain't going to heaven. Because what are you going to do when you get to heaven? There's people different color skin of you. You want to tell them to go to another building? <laughs> You better love people that don't love you. That's Jesus. That's, that means Christ is in you. This is what he's saying there in 9, 10, and 11. 
He who says he's in the light, hates his brother, he's, you're in darkness. You're blind, but you think you can see. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. One of the ways to know you're saved is, do you follow God's commands? And the other one, he gives it to you right here in these last five or six verses is, do you love all kinds of people? Listen to what I'm saying here. Loving somebody doesn't mean you approve of them. You're not tolerant. What do you mean by tolerant? You're free to live any perverted lifestyle that you want to, but I'm not going to say it's acceptable. I love you as a person. I'll always love you. I'll try to do my best to, if you're my neighbor, to give you something to eat. If you have a flat tire, help you change your flat tire. But loving you doesn't mean I approve of your lifestyle. If you're a 70 year old man that wants to be a five, with a five year old boy and America changes its laws to make it permissible, I love you, but I don't tolerate and accept what you're doing as right with God. So when I'm saying we love people, I'm not saying we approve of what they're doing. If the government is trying to force me, Herb, if you try to say and speak these things from the pulpit, we'll arrest you, then I'm not changing my message. We'll see on Judgment Day who was right, you or me, Mr. or Mrs. Government. So when it's saying love people, means I love you, I value you, you've been made in the image of God, but I love you enough to tell you the truth. I don't love you enough to shut my mouth and let you live in deception so that on Judgment Day, when you stand before God judged for all eternity, you won't look at me and say, but that guy didn't tell me. No, I did tell you. I told you, I spoke the truth in love, as the Bible says. And so this is three passages I want to give you. <clears throat> is verses 7 to 10, two more is Galatians 5 and 6. In Galatians, do we have a couple of more scripture verses? Yeah, Gal- For in Christ Jesus, neither being circumcised, you've got to understand a little Jewish history to understand this. For the Jewish people for since forever, until the, uh, the death of Christ, that to be... To show that you were one of God's chosen people, the, the, the boy, at seven days, he was circumcised, right? That, that proved he was different from all the other nations that didn't circumcise their children. This set you apart. They were very proud of that. I know it sounds weird to you because you're not from a Jewish culture, and they still do that today. But a person said, I belong to the Jewish nation by the fact that my boy has been circumcised. This is proof. We have the menorah, or we have the Ten Commandments there in our home. And they were very proud of the law. And others saying, nah, nah, we're so freed up in grace. You know, we can do what we want to do, and we can do whatever we want to do because we're free in grace. And Paul simply says this, for neither in Christ Jesus, neither being circumcised or not being, you're a child and you didn't have him circumcised. None of that matters except what? Faith working through. This is what we've been looking at. See, we're living in a culture that says, um, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Don't judge. Don't, who are you to judge? I've heard a lot of Christians say, oh, who am I to judge? You're a Christian. You have the word of God. You're supposed to discern right or wrong, right? We're supposed to make godly judgments, discerning. Uh, Matthew 7, 24 says we're supposed to judge. The backslider's favorite verse, the lost person's favorite verse is Matthew 7, 1 through 4. Judge not lest you be judged. A friend of mine says, yeah, and don't misquote Scripture lest you be like Satan. That's not what it's saying. It's not saying don't come to to solid uh, uh, decisions based upon proper evidence. Judging is, the bad judging is coming to a bad conclusion without sufficient evidence. And so a lot of people, they're saying, I know I'm not supposed to judge. Wait a minute. The guy has got the filthiest mouth. He's living with three ladies. He shoots cocaine. He's got a a, 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 a t-shirt that says, I'm an atheist, but I'm not supposed to judge. (laughs) How do you know to witness to a person? You have to judge. Oh, I've worked with this guy. You know, I think I want... The reason you decided to share your faith because his life or her life didn't match up, you judged. That's not a bad judging. And we're living in a culture telling you, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. In other words, let me sin and don't convict me. That's what they're saying. Let me sin and don't tell me I'm doing wrong. Because I'll throw something back in your face. Well, have you ever ran a stoplight? Oh, see, you're a sinner too. 
I think they're real clever. <laughs> yeah, okay, you got me on that one. So that means you're not a sinner now because you're doing this or that because I've done some stupid stuff. I'm agreeing with you. I do sin. You're saying that you're not in sin. That's the difference. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, none of that matters. It's faith, obeying the commands of God, working through the love, the two things we've been talking about this morning. And then it says it here in, in John 14. This is John quoting himself now. If you love me, if you're telling me you're saved, then let me ask you, are you keeping the commands of God? On a daily basis. And we Listen to me. He's not saying that makes you saved. He says that proves to other people you're saved. Herb, I'm going to get the Ten Commandments and try to follow them. That's not going to save you. Repenting and trusting what Jesus did at the cross, that saves you. This proves to people that Jesus is alive and real and that he's living in you and that you're saved. And it shows them Christ. This is what it's saying. If you love me, he didn't say this is how you get saved. This is proof that you are saved. See, faith looks like something. When people say, I have faith. Well, then it, if I was to say to you, you were to say to me, Herb, I got uh, watermelons out of my patch. And I said, oh, great. You mean that fruit that's kind of yellow and is about 10 or 12 inches of shape like that? And you'd probably say to me, what? Oh, but you're judging me. But you're judging correctly. A watermelon is not yellow and bent and looking like that. For those of you that are from the deep north, that's called a banana, just in case you hadn't figured that out. A banana looks like something, and so does a watermelon. Faith looks like something. It looks like Jesus living. So if you're saying, I have faith, I'm saved, then, then the obvious assumption is then you're living, trying to live like Christ. That's what I'm saying to you. Faith looks like something. Faith is not this nebulous, vague concept out there. No, faith means I am not trusting me and what I want to do. I'm trusting Jesus. I'm letting him live his life through me. He tells me what to do. I love him so much I want to honor him. That's how faith looks like. Following God's command by loving people. It's proof that a person is truly born again, that's proof that someone is truly saved. Okay, almost out of time. Let me just wrap it up here in just a second as we're looking at this. A lot of people think that following the commands of God are just hard. You ever been to a, a park and they got all kinds of signs? They have signs saying, you know, no skateboards, <clears throat> no walking on the grass, no loud music, no driving after 6 o'clock, no loitering. No, I mean, there's like 30 different things, right? No, no, no dog. No dog can drop bombs on the grass. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Just, just thing after thing after thing. And by the time you read the sign, you're saying, heck, honey, let's get back in the car. I'm going to be miserable if I come to this part. The commands are, of God aren't to make you miserable. They're to free you up. <laughs> So I don't live for myself and do this for myself. It's teaching me to love people. That frees me up. And so as we're looking at this passage, God is trying to free us up with these commands. He's trying to teach us how to love. Let me close with this because I've been taking too much time. A couple of thoughts. You're most like God when you love the unlovable. You're most like God when you walk in God's commands when your flesh doesn't want to do it. That's called faith. I have faith that doing God's will will glorify His name better than if I do my will. It's when you love people who have done nothing good for you. It's when you love people that, that can never pay you back. That, that's, that's when you're walking in love. Because if you're just, listen, if you're just loving somebody who's lovable... You're not loving them. You're just paying them back. You're giving them what they deserve. Let me close with this because we're out of time. I remember it was, uh, I forgot the name of the, the drug rehab. I, I can't remember. I think it was Teen Challenge. I can't remember in Philadelphia where it was. But a lady had come in. She was in her 20s, 30s, and she was really hooked on drugs bad. 
and uh, she wanted to, she was thinking about checking in, <clears throat> whether she just wanted a place to stay for the night or whether she just wanted to check in, I don't know. But she came in and she talked to the, the, the guy in charge of the induction center and he met her, was real polite, and, and was trying to get information from her. And she was so messed up on drugs that during the interview, she just began to vomit. <clears throat> I mean, just vomit everywhere. And it covered his shoes, you know, the bottom of his jeans and covered. And she was just vomiting. She was so messed up on drugs. <clears throat> and she said, the man said, excuse me, went and got a towel and began to just clean all the vomit off of his shoes. I think some got on her shoes, her heels, and he cleaned them off. And he continued the interview. And she said she broke. He didn't scold her. He didn't jump on her. He didn't say, what's wrong with you? How dare you come? He was just so full of love and acted like it was no big deal. And he just cleaned the vomit off of his shoes and off of hers and said, now let's continue where we were. And she said she broke right there and she got saved. She'd never seen love like that. <laughs> That's how people know you're saved, that when they treat you wrong, you treat them the way Christ treated you when you were wrong. Let's close with this, and then we'll pray this morning. Number four, or what it should have, Roman numeral three, it's whatever it says up on the screen. That's what it is. <laughs> See, knowing God is more than I have faith. That's wonderful. Everybody in this town says they have faith. Knowing God is more than I have faith in God. The Bible says the demons believe in Jesus, but not believe to get saved. Knowing God is more than just I have faith in God. The, the faith that moves me to love people and all kinds of people. People that disagree with me, that are rude, that are ugly. That's how Jesus is at work in your life that the thoughts that you have towards people are like that so that when you're in that encounter and they mistreat you you have been loving them in your mind for so long that your cup runneth over with mercy and grace if you're thinking the whole time they better treat me like this and then they do treat you and this spews out then you have to change the way you think true faith loves people